Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 255. So I was on Facebook and I saw these beautiful desserts and I'm like, oh, they, they look pretty cute. I think I can maybe do something like that. Attention gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, Gift Biz Gal, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and I'm so happy to have you here with me today. I'm going to start off with a quick announcement if you're in or around the Chicago and Wisconsin area. I want to make sure that you're aware of the Lakeside Women's Conference happening in Lake Geneva the second week of March. If you want to take in solid business building information, while meeting other women who get you and understand your struggles and drive, you'll love this event. Actually, you don't even have to be driving distance at all. Last year, we had women flying in from all over, including the speakers. In addition to myself, Nikki Rausch, Abby Herman, Bobby Bainey, who are all past podcast guests here, will be there and you can meet and learn from us in person. Robin puts on the most amazing event. It's in a beautiful lodge, but most important, the group of women she attracts provides for a safe, open, and supportive environment. And Lake Geneva is an adorable tourist area too, full of cute shops and the best restaurants. For all the details, go to Women's Business Workshop and look under events. You can use the code SUE100 to get $100 off your ticket. Let me know if I'm going to see you there. And now, speaking of girl power and energy, that is what my guest this week is all about. I tell the story of how we met in the interview, so I won't go into it here. But this lady, I'd hang out with any day. What I want you to listen to throughout our talk is specifically how the business got started and then evolved. It didn't begin as it is now. There were learnings, adjustments, and revisions to make things work and fit into Dee's life. She took it step by step, saw what was working for her, made adjustments, and has now added a brand new stream of income as her skills and industry knowledge grows. This show is full of all types of goodness. Let's get right to it, shall we? Today, I am so excited to introduce you to Deirdre Drakes of 823 Treats. Deirdre, known to her friends as Dee, is a true Southern girl born and raised in the small town of Enfield, North Carolina. In 2005, she settled in Charlotte and has since made it her home. She's a self-taught chocolate-based treat maker, proud Army wife, and mom of two. Dee's custom design edible creations have a long record of precise execution for large companies and customers alike. Her who's who list includes NBA players, NFL players, government officials, and celebrities. Her highly sought after domestic and international classes where she graciously teaches her techniques sell out at the 350 and up price point, making her not only a gifted treat maker, but a respected teacher. Her work has been featured in VH1, Bravo, Fox 46, and has been published in a national magazine. Oh my gosh, Dee, welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to speak with you. Me too. I met you at the Ultimate Sugar Show and... I saw you in a room. We had that fun little competitions, one of those first nights, and you were so bubbly and so energetic. And I am like, who is that girl? <laughs> I need to <laughs> know crazy who girl. she is. <laughs> the crazy girl in the corner. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You just attract people like a magnet just because of your passion. There's no question about that. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So over and above our intro, I'd like to have you share who you are in a little bit of a creative way, and that is through a motivational candle. So if you were to tell everybody and describe a candle that really resonates with you, Dee, 
what would the color be and what would be a quote or a motto that would be on your motivational candle? Ooh, I like this question. I would really have to say that if I had to choose a color, the color would definitely be white. I just think it goes with any aesthetic and a white candle just brings purity to the room. And also, if there's any blemishes, it shows. And I'm okay with that. Like, I'm an open book. My motivational quote would definitely have to be my favorite Bible verse, which is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And that's just because I'm blindly doing all of this through the faith and will of God. I couldn't do it without him. I love that. You are going to have to go back and listen, if you haven't already, to one of my podcasts, which is just a couple weeks back with Good Measures, Mm -hmm. because he had an experience there that I think you'll really be interested in. It totally blends in with what you're talking about with your Bible verses. So you'll have to do that. You might have heard it already. I don't know. (laughs) Definitely will make sure I re-listen if I have already. (laughs) Okay. And you know, I really like your explanation of the white candle. At first, I thought you were going to say, because that's like a nice, clean palette on which I can design all whatever I'm going to design, my beautiful cakes. But what I really liked is where you said, you know, if there's blemishes, that's okay. And that to me, not knowing you a whole lot, right, because I'm going to find all about out about you right now. But that's why you can just be so free and fun, because you're just going to be who you are. You're not worried yes. about what other people are thinking. Exactly. So take us back. Have you been baking and enjoying making cakes all your life or where did that start? No, actually, I just stumbled into this industry and and I have loved it. I started out as an event planner. I did weddings and parties. My last event was I was seven and a half months pregnant in heels, moving tables and chairs because I do not know how to sit still. That I have seen. (laughs) As you have seen, I cannot sit still. So after this wedding, my husband and I just had a conversation about how taxing that industry is with me going into becoming a first time mom. And I decided to just step back. Well, as we all know, being a new mom is an amazing experience on its own. But as a creative, being a new mom in that first month, it was extremely boring. Like, I love my baby. Don't get me wrong. He's the best thing ever. He's the cutest thing But it was periods where he was just doing nothing but sleeping. And I, as a creative, was going crazy. So I was on Facebook and I saw these beautiful desserts. And I'm like, oh, they they look pretty cute. I think I can maybe do something like that. And I just blindly went out and got some supplies. And I made a candy apple. And it was delicious. And I was like, okay, this is not going to be good for me because I am a sweet tooth person. But I did it. It was great. And my friends loved it. However, the medium of like hard candy was not really suitable for me as a new mom, because I don't know if you have, but I know maybe some of your listeners have known that once the candy reaches the breaking point, there is no coming back from that. And I found myself wasting a lot of product because my newborn son of course, took priority over me looking at a thermometer, making sure my candy is at the right temperature. So I stopped making candy apples and I came across the medium of chocolate and I fell in love because it was so forgiving. If I had to step away and attend to my child or do anything and the chocolate came back into a heart state, I could simply remelt it. So I asked one of my friends if I could make some chocolate cover Oreos for this event that they had coming up. And Sue, I had never made one ever. I just was like, I think I can do it. Okay, I'm going to try it. And I'm so glad it worked out because I would have hated to not come through for this event for her. But as soon as I did it, I fell in love and it has just went above what I thought coming into this, it would do. Well, you know, I love how your explanation was with the candy first and how it morphed into something that fits your lifestyle. Because if you would have decided candy, you probably would have stopped by now because it just wasn't a mix for you at that point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So you just blindly stepped out and said, okay, I'm going to do these chocolate covered Oreos. You ended up seeing success. And isn't it great when people come back and say, oh my gosh, they're so good. You did such a good job. That just fuels you to keep going. It made me feel so good. I felt like I had won a trophy. (laughs) (laughs) So what happened after that? So you had that one event and it went really well. Then what happened? 
after that and I saw that, hey, this is something that I can do, I just started buying supplies like we always do. I had to cut myself off at some point. But I just started like thinking of ideas and practicing more. I honestly did. I was like, okay, if I did it great without practice, let me try to invest some time in really figuring this thing out. And I just fell in love and it kept motivating me because I loved what I was doing. So were you considering it still a hobby at that point? I was. It was just something because I was planning on returning back to the corporate world a little after having my son. And I was like, okay, well, this will just get me through to keep my creative side because, you know, we can never lose that. And I wind up becoming a stay at home mom and I continue to get more requests and it became a legitimate business for me. So you started buying supplies because, let's face it, if we have a passion as a hobby, we're still going to buy all the things. <laughs> yes, right? all of them. <laughs> yeah, maybe not in the big sizes that you need, you know, if you're baking or designing in mass, right? But you got to have all the fancy tools and start perfecting your skills and, you know, all of that. At what point was it that you consciously said, all right, officially, this is going to turn into a business? I think it was when I was getting requests more frequently and I had to kind of plan out my day Mm -hmm. and my time and my week that I was like, okay, this can really work out for me and bring in additional income for my family. It can replace my event planning business. So once I got the customers coming in, well, even the requests, because let's face it, every person that requests doesn't become a customer. But I was just so intrigued and so motivated by the request that it made me focus on, let me make this into a passion turn business. Got it. Okay, two questions for you. What do you mean every request doesn't turn into a customer? What does that mean? Well, every person that contacts you, they will not always buy. Oh, got you. So they're calling and inquiring and they may order, they may not. Yes, but I'm still very appreciative of the consideration because that lets me know that people are thinking about my product. Yeah, and they might the next time. You know, it might just not be a fit for what they need right at that point. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then at what point did you start charging? I started charging, honestly, after that first order I did for my friend. It wasn't necessarily the amount that probably was a profit, Mm -hmm. but because I came from a business and I transitioned into another one, I knew the benefit of me not doing it for free at that point. But let's talk about my event planning business now. That was a lot of stuff done for free. But with this one, I just came in after my first one, I kind of said, okay, well, I'm going to charge this amount. And it was totally pennies. I think I was probably paying them to order from me, but at least they had a idea of value on my business. Right. And then you just increased your prices as you went. Yes. You know, I always am teaching people that right from the get go, you want to be charging a price where you're going to make at least some type of a profit because you're not in the charity business, right? Exactly. Let's face it, a lot of people don't know. You know, if they've not been in business before, they don't know. I'm like thrilled just to know that someone's even charging and then they can learn what the right price is down the road. Yes. But as you started raising your prices to what you felt was, let's just start with the proper price, because now I am quite sure you're much higher priced because of your skill level and your reputation and all of that. But did you see any trouble in increasing your prices to customers who had purchased from you before? I think whenever you make an increase in price on my side, there's like sort of a guilt in the beginning. A guilt? Yeah. And I take this, especially from a repeat customer, because I feel they are used to a certain price. And when they come back with a new price, me being the kind hearted person I am, it's kind of like, oh my goodness, I put myself in a personal aspect instead of a business aspect. So I don't relay that to my customer, but I do, you know, we all like, ooh, are people going to perceive this price? Are they still going to buy? But it's a necessity. We have to do that because like you said, we're not working for free. I have bills. I have kids. This is my livelihood. Well, and you only have so much time. Unless you're going to hire on other people, you only have so much time to make whatever it is they've ordered. So you can't get five orders and do them all in the same amount of time. You only can do however the production goes. You know what I'm getting at. But you have to be able to command a price that's going to make you money or you're just going to go out of business. 
yeah, that's exactly right. Or I'm going to not pay a bill and that's not going to (laughs) happen. That's not happening. That's not happening. (laughs) No, no. Okay, as we're just starting to talk and still in the intro time now, you'd like of the introduction of your business being created. How did you land upon your name? I love explaining my name. Oh, good. Good question. Yay. (laughs) Yes. So my name originally was August 23rd Events and Treats. And I created the handle 823 Treats just because I'm like, no one's going to want to type out the full thing. August 23rd is my wedding day. That is the day I married my husband. And when I was first thinking about business names, that was the first thing that came to mind because it was such an important day in my life. My husband and I have been together since I was 14. So he's like my life partner. I love him dearly and I don't want to cry. I really love that guy. And now all the world has heard. Isn't that fun? All the world knows my love for him. Um, So that has just been my business name. It's shortened to 823 Treats. And I always tell my husband, like, you can never leave me because I'm never changing my name, (laughs) my business name. (laughs) There you go. Well, he sounds like he's a huge supporter of what you're doing. He does. He does support me very well. I mean, sometimes he tells me to move my stuff out of his way. But other than that, he supports me very well. (laughs) Well, that's okay. I mean, you can't be too perfect, right? You know. (laughs) How did the business progress in terms of orders and size? And you've gotten to a point where you have some pretty prestigious customers. And one of the things that I always find, Dee, that people are asking all the time is, how do I get more business? And how do I get the customers that I need, the right customers who will pay the price that I'm requiring because of my skill level? So I'm curious how you started to build your customer base. Well, it did help me that I came from an event field. So in my industry, I kind of knew what the my buyer was expecting from an event treat. Also, I utilized social media for what is worth for a business. I mean, I put hashtags. I found out how many hashtags can I put on a post and I maximized that. And I started just trying out different things with those hashtags because hashtags are little search engines. And when people search for a word, I want my business to come up. So those are some of the things I did. Just knowing, like researching the industry that I'm in, staying true to who I am because sometimes people find value And you being true to who you are as in, hey, this is my price. I really appreciate you respecting that. If I'm not currently in your budget, that's fine. I would love to buy a $5 million house right now, but that's not in my budget. And we're okay with that. So those are some of the things that I did, Sue. You stay true to that, right? I mean, your prices are your prices. That is correct. My prices are my prices, especially in this industry, any creative industry. You have to quantify your time Mm -hmm. because we spend a lot of hours on these crafts or cakes and things of that nature. And that's valuable. For sure. So many people don't account for their time. And then you're still almost doing it for free because your time, let's face it, you also need time just for yourself. So anytime you're producing or you're working on your business in any way, is time being taken away from something else you could be doing? So it should be paid for, you know, and the way it's going to be paid for is in the price of your product that you're selling. That is correct. And I have a son who's four and a daughter. She's one, but her name is Corey, like my husband. So it's okay. Unisex names. (laughs) (laughs) That works. (laughs) Yes. The other thing I want to point out, and this is really for you guys, Gift Biz listeners, is Dee was just talking a minute ago that her other industry had been event planning and she had contacts and knowledge from that industry. You right now might be working at a bank. You might be working in a corporate office in the marketing department. You know, whatever your nine to five job is, if you have one right now and you're building your business on the side, think about whether there are opportunities there with context that you have through a totally different way, your full-time job right now, that could help you advance your business. This is not the first time I've heard people having their first customers be people who came out of connections from a full-time job. So huge opportunity. I'd also say school events. Well, your kids are too young yet, I guess, Dee. But school-aid children, when there are events and charities and all the things you get into, sports organizations, dance clubs, all of that are opportunities. Yeah, a lot of people ask me sometimes, like, how do you make the connections? How do you network? 
and network is so fluid for me because I am a people person. But if I wasn't just putting yourself in a position with people, we come in contact with people every day and just speaking and my business always comes up when I'm speaking to someone, honestly, and not the first time, the second time is it has to. Was it like that from the beginning? For business and personal, yes. Sue, I'm sorry to say this, but in school, in grade school, I used to have those little notes that said, D talks too much in class. She does excellent work, but she talks too much in class. I believe that, but it's working <laughs> in your favor now. <laughs> it surely is. <laughs> no, I asked that and bring it up because I also know a lot of people here, and it's the fear of failure, right? And putting yourself out there, want to start a business, but they don't want to tell people who are close to them until it's successful. And the fallacy in that is the people who are closest to you are probably your best first customers and forgiving you know if something goes wrong like if your shopping cart on your website goes down or the product isn't totally up to par yet they're great testers and working through all the systems but a lot of people won't do that because the business is just starting and what if it doesn't work then they have to go back with their tail between their legs yeah it happens to us all but that's a good point I can count how many times that I've had a family member order and maybe something went wrong, but it was such a great learning lesson. And I'm glad I could learn it with someone who knew me and could accept, I would say the error of some sort. And it was a good learning moment for me from someone who I knew wasn't going to like blast me and put me in a bad light to the public. Right. So definitely the idea right from the start of letting people know, and you were just bringing it up in casual conversations then. Right? Yes. You know, what's going on? Oh, you know, I've started doing a business. Here's how it happened. Chocolate covered Oreos, whatever. It was just conversation. It's not really promoting your business. It's just letting people know. Exactly. Just so seamless that it was just normal conversation. And as you said, casual. And you started getting business from that. I did. I was so amazed at how many people, as soon as they saw a picture And that's, I think, I don't know if we're going to get into that, but that's why it's so important to have like either a website or social media present because with crafting things, people buy with their eyes. So they saw a picture and it was like, oh yes, I am interested in this because it looks nice. So do you have it on your phone where you can pull it up right if you're in a conversation with someone? Yes, my Instagram page is by far the first app on my phone and I click it and just show a couple you don't want to be too aggressive and making sure they go like hey here's a couple you know what if you have social media look me up or if you have your phone out go to my website real quick so it just gives them that part in their mind to do right and so let's get into that then because this is another big topic all the time social media and let's just talk Instagram because I have a lot more I want to get into with you so we've talked about hashtags a little bit like they're mini search engines right yes And when you started posting on Instagram and adding hashtags, keeping in mind who your preferred customer would be, right, so that you're attracting the right people in, did you start seeing sales off of that that you equate directly back to Instagram or did it take a while to build or what was your experience there? When I started using the hashtags, I was doing it because I knew what it was for and I wasn't paying attention to it in the beginning. But once I really started focusing on the hashtags that I was using and looking at different things and I started asking people how they found me, I could really see that they were working for me because I had a lot of people say, well, I found you through an Instagram search. I was searching the hashtag X, Y, and Z. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, interesting. This really works. Yeah. That's how actually I got my first celebrity client was through, they found me on Instagram by searching one of my hashtags. Oh, that's crazy. And they came across my profile and they liked my work and they reached out to me. Yes. Wow. That's cool. It was so amazing. So I'm like, they work. (laughs) I bet after that, did they call you then to talk about an order? They did. And it went through. It was like the craziest thing. One of those ones where you have to mute the phone and like, okay, is this really happening? And (laughs) then go back into the professional voice. Like, okay, I'm back. (laughs) That's why I was asking, because I'm thinking when you got off the phone and hung up, you were probably like major happy dance. Like, "Ah!" oh, my goodness. (laughs) Screaming, calling my mom. That's the first person you have to call. Some insane news. My mom, you will not believe this. And (laughs) it was crazy. (laughs) That's so awesome. So now today, how often are you posting on Instagram? 
Well, I try to post once a day, at least something once a day. If not on my profile, I really try to post in my stories. And I have learned the value of using your Instagram stories to connect with your followers, your potential customers, or just people as your peers. So at least once a day, I'm trying to post. In somewhere, somewhere, some way. Somewhere, some way. Mm -hmm. Okay, got you. We're going to hear more about Dee's posting plan right after a quick word from our sponsor. Yes, it's possible. Increase your sales without adding a single customer. How, you ask? By offering personalization with your products. Wrap a cake box with a ribbon saying, Happy 30th birthday, Annie. Or add a special message and date to wedding or party favors for an extra meaningful touch. Where else can you get customization with a creatively spelled name or fine packaging that includes a saying whose meaning is known to a select two? Not only are customers willing to pay for these special touches, they'll tell their friends and word will spread about your company and products. You can create personalized ribbons and labels in seconds. Make just one or thousands without waiting weeks or having to spend money to order yards and yards. Print words in any language or font. Add logos, images, even photos. Perfect for branding or adding ingredient and flavor labels too. For more information, go to theribbonprintcompany.com. And what types of things, do you have any plan or structured system to make sure that you do that? Or is it just always top of mind, this is one thing I have to get done today? No, my followers know this. I am a big advocate for the AppShe auto posting app or any auto posting app. So I can schedule posts, especially the posts that are going on my profile, because my profile is basically just my business. My stories is where you get to see the craziness of me, D. So I'm using auto post app nine times out of 10. Is it called auto post? It is called AppShe and that's A-P-P-H-I. It does have a free mode as well, which I love and I utilize the most in the beginning. And then they do have some subscription plans that, you know, as you need to post more, because the free plan, I think, only allows you to post like 10 or 12 posts a month. So as you need to post more, you can go into a plan that will probably benefit your business. And will it automatically post over to Instagram? I'm using another scheduler and it still has to go to my phone and then I still have to actually put it onto Instagram. No, it auto posts. Like I have most of my posts scheduled for seven o'clock in the morning. And I'm not a morning person. And thankfully, my kids are not either. I'm still asleep at seven. I wake up to like a ton of notifications because the app has posted. And I honestly forget sometimes. And it has benefited me when I'm on vacation, too. I can still go through business. And I literally do not have to touch my phone or go into the app. It does it automatically for me. Oh, interesting. I didn't know such a thing existed yet. Oh, Sue is the best thing ever. (laughs) <laughs> All right, I'm going to be checking that out. <laughs> and what's your handle while we're talking about this so everyone can go look? My handle for Instagram is 823 treats, and that's T R E A T S, 823 treats. Okay, so let's keep talking about the evolution of your business. So we're talking about you providing all types of treats, right? But more bakery, chocolate specific? Yes. What's your specialty? Chocolate, chocolate and more chocolate. That's my specialty. (laughs) Chocolate dip thing. So I really started my business off with chocolate covered Oreos and they are still like my main product that I produce. I have grown to love my chocolate dip pretzels. They're like my favorite treat to make. And now this new wave of cake sickles, and I'm not sure someone may call it a cake pop still, but it's in the form of a little popsicle. And those things are just so cute. And I love making them. Yeah, they are so cute. You're right. Yeah, I'm, and, and it's just enough. It's not a big piece of cake. It's just enough. You don't feel totally cheating on whatever diet you're on if you have just one. If you have just one. <laughs> if you, you have just yourself, one. <laughs> because I can never, like Pringles, I can never eat just one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really big point. You've stayed very narrow with chocolate. Like everything is chocolate. There's different things under the category, but it's always chocolate. Exactly. Because that works for me. And I've tried to add other things to my menu and I've done some reevaluation of it and either it's not selling or I honestly don't enjoy making it. And if you're in a creative space and you don't enjoy making something, it doesn't make you happy. So I just stick to what I like to do that I will always be happy 
or when I'm working really late at night, the end game of this, I'm like excited about it because I get to see it. Right. No, I think that that's really smart because I think a lot of people would say, okay, well, I've got chocolate down now, but I'm going to be able to attract more business if I add in something else. And that's not always the case because now you with chocolate, you're known as the chocolate specialist then, right? Like this is your thing, your product, you know everything about it, you know all the designing, all the styling, all the flavoring, all of that versus if you also did marshmallow, candy, apples, like all the other things, right? Exactly. It works for some. It does work for some. But like I said, you have to figure out what works for you. All right. So tell me how this extension of teaching came about. I honestly love sharing this as well, Sue. So from my candle, I have a really great relationship with Christ. And it was the weirdest thing ever, Sue. I was laying in bed and I was told I need to teach a class. And I'm just looking around like, who, me? Like, me? Who are you talking about? So it just, like, came into you? Yeah, it just spoke. And I was faithful to that. And I have seen crazy growth from my classes. Okay, but that's too big a jump. I need to know more. Okay. <laughs> okay. So my first question is, did anything cross your mind? Like, well, wait a minute. I don't want to teach people my techniques because then they're going to copy me. And then my business is going to go down. Honestly, if I'm speaking, I have not came across that. However, I have had peers come to me who want to start teaching and they say, well, I want to teach, but I'm scared that in my community that I'm going to lose business. And for me, I feel like you can't get into teaching something if you are not prepared for someone to do what you're doing to make income. That's the whole purpose of teaching something. We do have students that take it that just want to have a fun night out or learn something new. And I'm also a big advocate that if it's not your gift, it's not going to flourish. So you can teach anybody to do anything, but you're still you. Right. I'm totally of the same opinion. And I also think to your point about if it's not your gift, you're probably not going to keep up with it. I think what often happens is people think I could make this just as well. You're buying the chocolates, let's say chocolate covered Oreos. Let's just keep with that theme. Oh, I could do that just as well. Well, you know what? Maybe or maybe not. But then they see all that goes into it, too. It's not just a one time, one afternoon, let's make chocolate Oreos. It's a business, right? And so they might do it initially and then at the end say, you know what? I really love these, but I don't have time, nor do I want to be making them. And I love these. So then they end up buying from you again anyway. Exactly. It has happened. It has exactly happened. All right. So... You buy into this feeling because you know where it's coming from and you decide you're going to teach. How did you pursue actually making that as an extension of your business? Like, where was the first place you taught? Let's go with that. The first place I taught was here in my city, Charlotte. It was on May 25th. And I sold out my class. Keep in mind, Sue, I'm like, who's going to take my class? I feel like I'm like nobody, sort of say. And my class sold out within 48 hours. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. And I added an additional class like two weeks later in my city, Charlotte. And that sold out, I would say, within three days. Was it a chocolate treat making class or was it a business class? It was learning how I make five of my treats. So you're just learning the intro of making those from my perspective. And was it connected with any organization or did you just rent out some space because you got that event planner expertise? It wasn't connected with a venue. Actually, I wanted to host it in my home, but I have kids and, you know, let's keep it honest. I didn't know who was coming in, so I didn't want people like knowing where I live. I had a house that I rented out to do the class for. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. So you knew a house that was vacant at the time or someone who was willing to let you use their house or however that went down. I actually used Airbnb. Oh, what a good idea. Yeah, it was so cool. I was like, yeah, I'll use that. And the biggest thing with that was just contacting the host and being upfront about what I was doing there so they could approve it or not. And all of my hosts have been like, yeah, I want to take a class. <laughs> so come on in. Such a good idea. Oh, I might steal that idea, D. <laughs> take it. 
yeah it's free of charge <laughs> yeah because it's also an intimate atmosphere too right it's almost like being in the home kitchen which is where everyone would be cooking anyway if you had things to talk about before you actually started getting into the techniques you could be sitting in the living room family room whatever oh excellent idea really good I love the space. It really does feel good. And we feel like a little family while we're there. So I like it. Yeah, for sure. And so how did this progress? Well, once the classes in Charlotte did so well, I had so many inquiries from people to come to other cities. And I found some connections there. Like I went to LA, but I have a great friend and I met her through the business. It was so crazy. She was a vendor of mine. And we found out that we had kids literally a week after each other and we just became more and more friends and she was like well you can come out to LA and I can host your class so just making those connections and I went to LA my international class was in Barbados and that right there was so crazy because Sue my husband is from Barbados and I would have never thought that I would be going there to teach without his knowledge without any connections from him I'm like dude I'm going to your country to teach what I do isn't that crazy so, yeah, it's just been a wild ride. I'm going to say there was some divine intervention in there for that one, too. <laughs> of course. Of course. I'm like, we were meant to be. You see all of this coming back full circle? We were meant to be. <laughs> for sure. So does he still have family there? Yes, he does. So I was able to see some of his family. And like I said, it was so crazy going back to the island without him. But I was very comfortable there and I'm like, I know where I'm going. No one can kidnap me. <laughs> so yeah, he still has family there and we visit maybe every other year or so. I love it there. We had our honeymoon in Barbados. Oh, look at that. Many years ago now, but we also over my other business, the ribbon print company. Also, we have customers in Barbados as well who have these ribbon printing machines that we sell. Awesome. Yeah. Anytime we get an international customer, I'm like, well, would you like to pay for hand delivery <laughs> and teaching? <laughs> I know, right? It's only another $2,000. <laughs> no biggie. No biggie. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so how are you balancing the two, teaching versus selling products? How does that look in your overall life? That is a good question. It took me a while to figure out a good balance especially with me also balancing my home life. But now I actually can focus more on my teaching because I like to give knowledge. I like to be around people. I am like the definition of an extrovert. Like I love people. So I do kind of focus more on the teaching and I take orders to where it fits into the teaching schedule. Does that make sense? Yeah, so teaching is the primary right now. And then you'll take orders as you can based on schedules and how complex the order is and quantity and, you know, all of that. Yes. Got it. Okay. And as we talked about in the beginning, I met you at the Ultimate Sugar Show. Were you teaching there? I did. I taught two classes at the Ultimate Sugar Show. I taught two demo classes, one how to do lace with fondant and the other one how to do a little cake topper. Perfect. And so people in your classes were people who were also in business or they just also wanted to know the skill for personal use. Do you know? A lot of them were in business. It was so crazy. In my first demo, the Lace with Fondant, one of my students that I had in Charlotte, she's from Ohio. She was in that class in Atlanta and she was like, I didn't think you were going to remember me. I'm like, I remember everyone. <laughs> so it was a lot of people that were already in the tree industry, but it was so strange that the majority of them did not follow me. So that was pretty interesting to me. They didn't follow me on social media. They just wanted to learn that technique, but then I got them to follow me, of course. Well, of course, they, they follow me. you now. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. So is that another strategy for, I guess it's ex just exposure, right? Because they're taking classes from you there. And this is a show where each of the classes will also cost money. So this isn't a show where when you go into the show, I'm talking to our listeners now, where you go into the show and then you have availability to go into any of the classes. These classes all cost money. I teach at shows that do both. And most of my classes are business development classes, starting out, learning how to start a business properly, you know, all that, the businessy type things. And I do both, you know, at the Ultimate Sugar Show and then here in a couple weeks, this will be passed by the time this airs. But the Philly Candy Show, we do it different. 
anybody who has a ticket to the show can go to any of the classes that they want. And I'm not sure which is better, but I kind of feel like when someone has to pay for a class, they're more vested in the information. What do you think? I really think that once you pay for something, you're invested. Who wants to just throw their money away? So when they are paying for a class, I feel like they're going to really pay attention, really try to go back and apply this knowledge to their business or craft. I agree with you there. Okay, so as you think about your business or you think about people who have been in your classes or your own experience, have you found any common mistakes that people make or maybe warnings for our listeners if they're looking at following a similar track as you? Maybe not chocolate, some type of a handmade product. But do you have any advice for those people? I would definitely say we talked about this, the charging. You want to make sure that you are putting a price on your work. That's a main mistake that I see a lot of us entrepreneurs or crafters or treaters coming into the industry with. Also trying to do multiple things at one time. Really focus on a few things and get those down packed before you move on to something else. And it's not saying you shouldn't add additional things, but really try to focus on perfecting a few things first before you put like 50 things on your menu or in your store. Good advice for sure. So in terms of attracting business, social media, yes. Communicating with people in conversations, yes. Those are your two primary ways of getting business? Those are my two because, honestly, I have a website. I've been paying for my domain for over five years. I just told my followers this, and I have not launched it. And this year, that is my goal. But it hasn't been a thorn for me not having an actual website because social media is very important nowadays. But In case social media goes away, you want to have your own website. So that's why in 2020, I'm focused on launching my website fully. I am so glad you said that. (laughs) I was getting a little nervous (laughs) when you were saying just relying on Facebook. What was it? March? I forget the date now, but March of this past year in, in 2019. Do you remember when Facebook and Instagram went down and like the whole world was freaking out? Yes. And If that isn't a wake-up call to all of us who aren't keeping contact information of our followers in some other way, Mm -hmm. I don't know what is, right? Exactly. That's what scared me. I'm like, you know what? It's time to get off of this because anything can happen. They can honestly wake up and say the application is just closed. Right. And then like all those followers you had are gone. You didn't obtain any information. I also use MailChimp, a data collecting application. Good, good, good. So I like that. Yep. Okay. So you're using MailChimp. So you're collecting emails from followers in some way. Is it just your customers? No, these are from followers for my classes. Though I haven't did it for my customers. I need to do it. But these I'm getting emails if they want to be notified of like where I'm at and things of that nature. So I've got a really good subscriber list for that. And in MailChimp, you can also divide who are people who are coming to your classes versus who have purchased product, you know, so you can talk to them differently. So really good initiative for this year. Yes. So guess what, Dee? We're all going to hold you accountable to this because (laughs) when you have your website up, I want you to let me know so we can add it to the show notes page so everyone can go back and look at it. Okay? I will. I definitely will, Sue. Okay. You've just told us all. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm nervous now. <laughs> the pressure is on. This is accountability, baby. <laughs> yes. Bring us to a point that wasn't so great. And the reason I asked this question is I think a lot of our listeners will feel like if everything isn't successful right out of the gate, they think, I'm a failure. I'm not cut out for this. I see other people who are doing so great. And I Obviously, I can't because something has gone wrong for them, right? So share with us something that went wrong for you just by demonstration that it's not all roses. You don't land it every single time. How many examples do you want me to give? Because that has happened. (laughs) I want you to give the (laughs) biggest one, the jaw-dropping one. (laughs) Well, I think this, and I was very established, I felt, in my career. I had had a customer... This was a repeat customer, actually. So this was a kind of a tricky one. It was very emotional for me. I had a new baby, my daughter at the time, and I did this order. And I mean, Sue, I put so much time into this order. 
I did not go to sleep because I had a, a new baby. So I was up without sleep working off of caffeine. And I looked at my final product and I was extremely happy because, again, I've been established for some time. And I went and made the delivery. One, the delivery was late, all my fault. And that was the first part that really kind of set the tone, I think. I could not make my delivery on time and I'm usually very punctual with my deliveries. Two, I met the customer and I gave it to them and they were in a rush. They had to get to where they were going, which is understandable. Well, about an hour after that transaction, I get a call and the customer was completely disappointed with my order. They said that I didn't interpret the vision properly. And they honestly said that they could have did this order themselves. Talk about a knife in the heart. Those are exactly the words I was thinking. Exactly. Oh, I was in Chick-fil-A's drive-thru line and I cried. And Chick-fil-A being the amazing people, they gave me free food. You know, that was (laughs) completely cool. But because the lady was like, why are you crying? And I, I was uncontrollably crying because I dedicated so much time to that. And I was really happy with the order. But again, it's not always about us. It's about how our customers perceive us. And the customer wasn't happy. Like I said, when they said they could have made it themselves, I just lost it. Well, you know that's not true. You know, that was their emotion talking. I really think so because I was looking at that and we want to say in our head, of course, we say all this stuff like, you try it. Why don't you try it? But, you know, I couldn't take away that that's how she felt. Right. But it also just was like, Oh my goodness. I thought everyone liked all of my work, but it was so humbling one. And it just really made me kind of think about going forward. How am I getting the information from the customer to make sure that I am kind of meeting the mark with their expectations and also letting customers know that I have creative freedom as well in interpreting the design. So those are some things that I learned from that. Right. Well, I love that you kind of adjusted your systems to try and prevent that in the future. Plus, I'm thinking this is another place where your Instagram account comes into play because they see your type of style demonstrated there. So different types of things that you've done, they have to buy into your style. And then to your point about creative flexibility, because they don't want their treats probably to look like everyone else's anyway. No, they want custom. And that's what custom is different. So yeah. Oh my gosh. So if that were ever to happen to you again, how would you handle it differently? Or what would you say to yourself? Differently than crying? Oh. Or would you cry again? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I think I would probably cry again. I really don't know. It just depends. I was kind of hormonal too at that point with the kids and just like working off of no sleep and now having to mom mode. So it was just a lot of stressors. I really think in this part of my business, if that was to happen again, I would definitely have a conversation with the customer. If a customer was to tell me that I missed the mark on their order, I would kind of say, ask the question, what were you expecting? Kind of putting it in their court Mm. and saying, what about my work did you see? Like trying to direct them back to my page. Like, did you see any of this in the work that I already provided? Because this is kind of my tone or my style. I don't know. I don't even know if this is a good answer. Did you ever talk to that customer again? To be honest, Sue, I have. They've tried to order from me three times. And thankfully, I have been busy each time because in my mind, I'm kind of scared to actually go back to do that. I don't feel like I can meet your expectations. And at one point I did tell her, I said, I would really like to take this order. Unfortunately, I'm busy this weekend, and I really want to make sure your expectations are met. Oh, that's good. Like, you're acknowledging the past, and you're going to do your best. Because you know what I'm wondering? Maybe it wasn't what she envisioned, but when she actually laid it out for the event, because it was the design work. It wasn't the taste or the flavor or anything, right? It was the style. It was the creativity. And so maybe it didn't align with what she was thinking, but she might have gotten great feedback from her guests. She did. I actually saw it. My feedback on my social media was like through the roof on that order. So it was really just a personal thing. And with any crafting or creative thing, it is personal interpretation from you and from the customer. So I have grown from that and I've learned not to, you know, I take it with a grain of salt, but purposefully with a grain of salt that you won't be able to meet everyone's expectations or interpretations all the time. 
Yeah. You do your best. Do your best. Yeah. You also have to know, I think that, I guess it's not in all cases, but I'd say in this case, because it's not like you provided a bad product at all, right? It would be different if the chocolate was all melted, like there were was an issue with the product. We all have to remember this, that when clients are like that, you know, it might not really even be about the product. You know, they might have had just a fight with their husband. There might be other issues going on. They may be hormonal, <laughs> you know. And I was late. There were so many other things. It's just you're the one. Well, you were late. And you own it, right? You own that. Yeah, I owned it. So I could have added to that frustration. And it just, I look back at the pictures, and I don't know if this will make the podcast, but I actually look back at the pictures, and my treats went exactly with the party. It was crazy. They went exactly with the party. So it was just some additional factors that I'm not going to hold her accountable for. So yeah. Good attitude for sure. So where do you think you're going in the future with 823 Treats? In the future for this business, I honestly see me teaching more because I came into this industry, I would say by happenstance, it was purposeful but by happenstance, it wasn't my ultimate passion. So I love pouring back into people that really want to grow and maybe open up a shop or do things of that nature. So I really see me just teaching more people, learning the skills and learning the basics to grow their business. Okay, love that. Love that. So we're going to have to keep an eye out for you. Maybe there are some other aspiring treat makers who should be taking some of your classes. Come on, come to the sweet side. Come to the sweet side. <laughs> yes. And we're, I think I already know what you're going to say, but if you were to direct someone online where to come find you, where would that be right now? Right now it would be Instagram. Where else is it going to be in the future? Your website. It's going to be where you can go to www.823treats.com. Okay, we're going to be watching for that. <laughs> and one final thing I want you to talk about just really quickly. You mentioned okay. it in our pre-chat. Once we're done with this interview, you're hopping in your car. And where are you off to? I am off to Atlanta to attend the B Collective Awards. I have been so humbled and so honored to be nominated for the 2020 Best Dessert Artist. And I'm going down there to celebrate and just being nominated and celebrate and all of the amazing people that's there. So that's where I'm going right after this interview. I'm so excited. That is so exciting. And I've seen a few of your designs and they're so awesome. I'm not surprised at all. And I just, I congratulate you on the fact that you're being acknowledged for your beautiful work as well. So can't wait to hear the outcome of that, but I love your attitude. Just being nominated and getting to be part of that whole thing has to be, be awesome and just feel fabulous. It is. Thank you so much for that, Sue. I really do appreciate that. You're welcome. And thank you so much. All this information has been great. I have loved learning your story. I can't wait to see you again. I know I'll see you at the Ultimate Sugar Show. Don't know if we'll cross paths before that. Just not sure. But thank you again for all your information, being very open and giving us a peek behind the scenes in your business. I know it's going to help a lot of people out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoyed this whole experience. And I can't wait to connect with some of your listeners. Yay. Wonderful. I'm sure they'll be connecting with you on Instagram for sure. <laughs> Have a great day. You do the same, Sue. So now, are you as in love with Dee as I am? I can't wait to watch the progression of 823 Treats. And as it applies to your business development, if something popped out to you, please make yourself a note. I love that you're listening and hopefully subscribe to this podcast, but I also want you acting upon what you learn. It's the action that brings results. But what if you're nervous about starting or worried that you don't know what your first step or next step should be? In working with many of you, I know fear is a huge concern. Fear of not knowing, fear of being judged, fear of failure. Confronting and moving through fear is the topic we're tackling next week. I look forward to all of us being together again then. Bye for now. 
I want to make sure you're familiar with my free Facebook group called Gift Biz Breeze. It's a place where we all gather and are a community to support each other. I've got a really fun post in there that's my favorite of the week, I have to say, where I invite all of you to share what you're doing, to show pictures of your product, to show what you're working on for the week, to get reaction from other people, and just for fun, because we all get to see the wonderful products that everybody in the community is making my favorite post every single week, without doubt. Wait, what? Aren't you part of the group already? If not, make sure to jump over to Facebook and search for the group Gift Biz Breeze. Don't delay. Come join us in Gift Biz Breeze. Today, 